Let's see, we got the film, we got the camera, got my podium. All right, so. Okay. Web team. Ah! <laughs> Oh, Maria, for that. You just keep happening to her. It's a really weird thing. She really shot up. <laughs> okay, so. That was not my film. I know, it's so sad. Yeah, that would just be a legend now. Two people think the myth. That could never have happened. Republicans bitterly criticized this. There was no declared war, they raised taxes, they feared a large standing army. And in response to this criticism and federalist fear of the growing power of the Republicans, they would sign three laws that we lumped together as the Alien and Sedition Acts. We just lumped the three laws together as that. And these are going to become some of the most divisive acts, controversial acts in American history. That is the Sedition Act right here. Laws then had to be handwritten, the official legal document, pre-typewriter. So it all had to be handwritten. In fact, it would be until the 1870s that they start using a typewriter for that. And the three laws, the three parts we need to know, they made it more difficult to be a citizen. Had to be in the U.S. Um, 14 years instead of five. So they increased it from five to 14 to become a naturalized citizen. What is it today? Hmm? No, seven years. You have here a long time. And it's a lot more than that. You gotta go through it. It's difficult to become a citizen. If anyone's ever had it, gone through that or know anybody who has, it's a it's a long, pretty painful process. So it's it's not as easy as it used to be. It went down to a year for a while. But Congress can change that because Congress decides citizenship. Except for after the 14th Amendment, Everybody born in the United States is a citizen. That's the 14th Amendment. But they figured most new immigrants were going to be Republicans, so let's make it more difficult. So the Republicans knew this was a law geared against them. The Federalists still had a majority, but Federalists could see the next election will probably be, probably be a Republican majority. Next part, dangerous aliens. And that's how they spelled it in the law. I just thought that was funny, so I put that in there. Free dictionary, dangerous. Dangerous aliens could be or deported if they were going to cause some kind of injury or danger to public safety inside of riots, inside of revolution. And the example they gave was Citizen Guinea. The French got rid of all titles during the French Revolution and everybody became citizen instead of sire or whatever. He came over from France to try to get the U.S. to join the revolution. And Federalists turned him into, into kind of a boogeyman. That he was going to bring the French Revolution to the United States, and these kind of dangerous, non-American citizens were going to come in and cause this disruption. And you'll see this time after time in history for both of these. This one especially, like a 1850s, the fear of Catholic immigrants were going to turn us into a papist state, only following the Pope. And after World War I, dangerous aliens from Eastern Europe are going to bring communism and Bolshevism. And eventually they'll be banned except for Western Europe. And you can see it today, talking about immigrants and it's kind of drummed up because a lot of it is not true, fear of what immigrants are doing here. So Guinea was a big one. And lastly, sedition. The Sedition Act said no sedition against government. Sedition means, it's a complex term, but in this context it means cannot speak out against the government's war effort. So it's no criticism of the government's war effort. So basically what it's saying is, though it's telling Republicans, you criticize the government, and we're going to call it sedition. Because the government decides what sedition is. Sedition is an open-ended law, which gives a great amount of power into the hands of the government. And this can threaten people. Nobody wants to go to jail unless they are extremely dedicated or crazy. So this will shut people up. Yeah. Isn't this against the first amendment? Because it says that the government can't pass a law against... Abridging the freedom of speech. 
you said exactly what the Republicans said. The Republicans said, this by definition is abolishing freedom of speech. Because everybody knew what, at least wanted to believe, if you're a Republican, what the Federalists were doing. This will shut them up. Because they'll say any criticism of the government is actually helping the enemy and you're a traitor. But what a great way to stifle political speech, isn't it? Every totalitarian state in the 20th century, the first thing they would do is, this would be the second thing, pass a law like this, it just ends political discussion. What's the first thing they would do? You need a reason for it. Something like a war. I didn't say war. Something like a war. It could be war. Something like it. And then you ban freedom of speech because you're helping the enemy. You take over. Every totalitarian state did it. Stalin to Mussolini to Idi Amin in Uganda. Yeah. Who created these acts? Federals. Adams actually didn't like all three of them. He really did not like the Sedition Act. But Adams saw this as this doesn't violate the First Amendment because sedition is helping the enemy. So that's not free speech, that's treason, as he saw it. So he signed the bill reluctantly, even though he, he actually would not have passed the bill. He thought, I can see why they banned this. So he is now going to be tied to this bill. This is really going to hurt him politically. Republicans are going to go nuts, violating the First Amendment. They're going to create a dictatorship. In fact, what they said was, just like we told you. They want to create a monarchy. They want to take over full control. It's going to be just like King George never left. How do you get rid of an unconstitutional law? Make another one. <laughs> Make another law? But the Supreme Court did not yet have that function. They gave themselves that function. It's kind of ironic, but five years later. And even then, it wasn't sure if they had that function all the way until after the Civil War. So you're right, but then it wasn't clear. You could repeal the law, but Federalists aren't going to repeal their law. What do you do? Madison thought the president would veto it. The president signed it. What do you do? Take it to the states. Two states would pass resolutions in their assembly. Where is it at? The Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. This was done by their state assembly, but Jefferson actually wrote it for them. Virginia Madison wrote it. And what they said was, they laid down the doctrine of, it's right here on this document from 1833, nullification. Nullification. And what it meant is, if there's an unconstitutional law, states can nullify unconstitutional laws. But do you notice what I did? I put it in quotes. Because the states can therefore claim it's unconstitutional, but it's just a law they don't like or might hurt a key industry in their in their state. Like, I'm trying to throw one out here. Slavery. I'm sure slavery won't be an issue down the road. Don't worry about it. Nothing to see here. So basically it's saying that the states don't have to obey unconstitutional laws if they don't want to. So Virginia, Kentucky um, said this resolution saying, hey, states don't have to obey unconstitutional laws, and we might... We might nullify the Sedition Act. But here's the bad part. This is why it's scary. So let's say the federal government says, no, you're going to obey, and we're going to send the army to make you obey. And the resolution said the states can do what? And this is where it gets scary. They, no, they already would have a militia, but yeah, they could organize their militia to defend themselves, but even take the next bigger step. Secede from the Union. How do we spell secede, by the way? S-E-C-E-D-E. -E. It's C-C. Means -C. leave the Union. It's not success. It's C-C. And what it said is, we'll leave the Union. So basically, the Vice President of the United States and the Speaker of the House of Representatives to officers of the United States government, to the highest level officers of the U.S. government, are talking destruction of the federal government. <laughs> what a scary time. If states don't obey federal law, the union is gone. It's over. It will not survive. And if there is a session, 
Secession, by definition, means destroying the country. So this is a major step. Now, fortunately, that didn't happen. Before we get to that, though, this is the handbill announcing the Kentucky Resolutions in 1799. This is 1833. Future generations, especially in the South, but it would also happen in New England, are going to not like certain federal laws, and they're going to say, we want to stop those laws by threatening nullification, and who would they use to justify it? Jefferson and Madison. By putting their pen to that paper and drafting this for the, for the different assemblies, it's going to set the precedent for what's... Heck, New England states are going to try to nullify the War of 1812. In 1833, southern states tried to nullify the tariff, and that's what this is about. But the whole thing was about slavery. Tariff was just kind of a symbol of it. If that would have happened, there would have been civil war and the Union would not have survived, I guarantee it. It about happened again in 1850. It leads to what's called the Compromise of 1850. And then, of course, the Civil War in 1861. And the country would not have survived this if they would have nullified it. And just a couple years ago, Texas was talking about nullifying a couple of federal laws. They actually had a resolution in their state assembly two years ago to nullify a law. There's actually a couple of different laws. They want, to, they want to nullify an immigration, part of an immigration law. They want to nullify part of the Clean Air Act and want to nullify, nullify part of the Affordable Care Act. They can't do that. We fought a war. They lost. That side lost. But then again, I know what a lot of you are thinking, and yes. What are you thinking? It is Texas. And it's, it's, Texas kind of is like that. You spend to Texas? I was born in Texas. Yeah. You're born in what part of Texas? Fort Worth. Fort Worth. Anybody else? It's only in this row. I've been to Texas. Where at? Uh, where? Uh, I'm not sure where it is for today. <laughs> and where at in Texas? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, Fort Hill. Okay. Texas is. It, I like Texas. It's interesting. Austin's really cool. But Texas has a kind of an independent streak. Hey, they were their own country, the Lone Star Republic. Well, with that, and Texas, and Texas is, we should all go. Austin's really cool. The LBJ library is there. Come on, people. LBJ for the USA, right behind you. Look, he's always looking at you. President Johnson. Look! You don't trust me. <laughs> well, this gives you an idea about the power of nullification. Fortunately, they didn't nullify the sedition law because the war ended. In Europe in 1800, there was a convention to end at least the, what was it, the War of the Second Coalition, if you're knowing about the French Revolution and those wars. There's only seven coalition wars. But the convention of 1800 would lead to kind of peace. Kind of. That's the actual peace agreement. That's the Constitution fighting. So, the law was not repeated. Pardon me, sorry, the law, um, the law was not nullified. The constitutional crisis ended. And one of the first acts President John Jefferson had as president was to sign the bill repealing the Sedition Act. He's not president yet. Yeah. No, he would be in 1801. But one of, this is still out. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those great what ifs in history. Because if that would have happened, the country would not have survived, and who knows? Well, speaking of that, let's have an election. 1800, also known as the election of 1800. Two people are running. This hatchet-nosed man is the vice president, the Republican Jefferson. And I love this picture. <laughs> it's on a flag, and it's got a... And it was drawn in and so on watercolored it. It's Jefferson, President, and Adams no more. And then there's John Adams. And I thought no one could get worse than that picture until I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> it's him drawn on a banner for him. Campaigns were not like today. The candidates did not campaign. But it was a nasty campaign of Republicans in newspapers and pamphlets accusing the Federalists and Adams of being a, like a king and a dictator, just like we had King George III. That was a big constant state. King George is coming back. 
Well, Jefferson was called a dangerous revolutionary that's going to destroy the country, and he's a slave. Is that what they actually Hmm? No, that this actually looks more like Jefferson, and this looks more like Adams. <laughs> yeah, they look kind of like that. You know, they always lighten the features on paintings. Yeah. So the Federalists were the Hamiltonians, mm -hmm. and then the Republicans were the Hamiltonians. Yes. Mm -hmm. What did they call Jefferson? They called Jefferson a dangerous radical to bring the French Revolution to the United States. But then more and more in the North, they were talking about the the uh, degenerative practice of slavery. It's kind of whispered. In 1804, slavery would come back. And it would become a major issue in the North. But then again, probably rally the South to one candidate. And I just like those. I, I think those are great things. And It's kind of buzzard looking. Or Is it a buzzard or a dragon? I don't know. But I guess it's supposed to be an eagle. Well, the election was very close. And the plan was... Remember, all the electors had two votes. All of them would vote for their, their party, their candidate. So all the electors, Republicans, would vote for Jefferson and Aaron Burr, the vice president. He, the, he was chosen by Republicans to be the vice president. For the Federalist, vote for Adams, and then for Thomas Pink, of South Carolina. All but one. So the idea being, you wouldn't have a top, or you wouldn't have a Federalist president and a Republican vice president or vice versa again. And so when the votes came out, well, the Republicans did it, I'm, the, the Federalists did it exactly like they were supposed to. One federate, a Federalist voted for John Jay, the Chief Justice. That was just a throwaway vote, so there wouldn't be a tie. But when the Republican electors met in the brand new city of Washington, D.C., that January of 1801, when they met, nobody was sure who was supposed to vote for Burr and not vote for Burr. So they all voted for Burr. Do you see the problem? There has to be one candidate with a majority, not a tie. So it goes to the House of Representatives. A disaster. Now, Jefferson did not choose Burr. Burr was chosen by Republicans in Congress. That's how they chose candidates. And it's not that they liked Burr, but Burr was from New York, and these 12 electoral votes would be crucial, and they thought he could bring him, which as it turned out, he did bring him. While the rest of the Northeast voted for the Federals. But Burr should have backed out. Burr should have said, Jefferson's supposed to be president, that's the way it's meant to be. No, what did Burr decide? Being president sounds pretty fun. I'm going to do it. And so he didn't back down. And who else thought, you know, it'd be great if Burr won and Jefferson lost? <laughs> Hamilton and the Federalists. Yeah. The Federalists are like, yeah, Burr. Burr is great. Because that would just, heck, they would destroy the Republicans, split them right in half. And so it went to the House. Every state gets one vote. This picture on the side here is a painting of that. It's supposed to be a the debate about this. Every state gets one vote. So no matter how many members of the House you have, every state gets one vote in this election. So all the members of the House, of let's say all 10 of them from New York, they get together and vote, which is called a caucus. And then whoever wins that vote gets all the electors of that state. Well, you notice something. Jefferson won. Why? A lot of Federalists decided, kind of looking back at it, including, and this is the most important one you have to get down, Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton looked at this and thought, what are we saying? If we go against the will of the electors, the will of the people to choose Burr just to destroy the Republican Party, that kind of political stunt would discredit the Constitution and maybe bring down the country. Hamilton thought, we can't destroy the country for this. We might not like Jefferson, but Hamilton thought Burr was an absolute disaster. Crooked, he will do whatever it takes to get personal power. Hamilton thought Burr was the worst type of American. You can't have Burr. He'd been a political opponent of Burr for years. Now Burr, 
Actually, it was not as bad as Hamilton, but at least then, Burr will turn out to be pretty bad. Who knows if it would have just happened anyways, but a lot of things are going to happen to Burr. He was another war hero. He was very intelligent, but he had this kind of aura that he would do anything. And so a couple of Federalist-controlled states just didn't vote. Rather than vote for Jefferson, they just left their ballots blank. And Jefferson won because of Hamilton. Burr would never forgive Hamilton. He blamed Hamilton for not being president. Two years, two years later, Burr would try to run for governor of New York, and guess who he blamed for scuttling that campaign? Hamilton. I wonder what we're leading to. <laughs> Something's going to happen here. Which is a shame, because it's going to pretty much end dueling in the North forever. Darn it. A dueling in the South will go on for a long time. Is that like what we saw in the movie where they were shooting mm -hmm. each other? Okay. Yeah, Burr and Hamilton. I mean, Andrew Jackson's going to fight over 100 duels. Don't mess with Andrew Jackson. One more little issue. Jefferson did become president, but, mouse, mouse, slave power. I mentioned this one but once before. What was the compromise during the Constitution about counting slaves towards representation? Slave power, get this down, is the three-fifths compromise. That's what Northerners called it. It wasn't that slaves had power. It was because the slaveholders got more power. There's going to be more representatives per white voter in the South than the North because of the three-fifths clause. The three-fifths clause. So this is going to give more members of the House and more electors to the South. Now, this is horrifically racist. I know that for both sides. So I'm not say, defending the Northern position. But this is going to be one of their biggest issues against the expansion of slavery. The expansion of slavery is the expansion of slave power due to the three-fifths compromise. If only white citizens were counted, that's what the Northerners said. If only white citizens, and they would argue, you can't count property. That's not people. If only white citizens, the vote in the Electoral College would have been 65 for Adams, 63 for Jefferson. And Adams would have been reelected. Because everyone got that, because of slave power, Adams lost. Now, you can make a lot of arguments. We talk about what, what's fair and what's not fair, but there's no way you could possibly say the whole system was fair because of slavery. So, so the North is going to hate the treatment as compromise. A number of laws are going to be passed that will directly or indirectly benefit slaveholders because of the three best compromise. This will influence presidential elections and greatly influence the two political parties that are going to begin to develop by the 1830s because of the three-fifths compromise. So when this issue about slavery in the territories, well, slavery spread across the Mississippi River, which will be the trigger of civil war, slavery in the territory. The North never forgot slave power. I want to talk about it and talk about it. And that's why they called Jefferson the Negro president. Now they called him the Negro president because Jefferson was not helping blacks, not helping slaves. It's because he was a slaveholder and he was a slaveholder's president. This cartoon, it's, it is racist, it's kind of awful in so many ways you look at it, but it was a northern cartoon from 1800. And it says the philosophic cock, and it means like the philosopher who's also the rooster and the hens his flock are slaves. For reasons that are just kind of unclear, but it's cultural for the time, Africans, they always rule with the turban. That makes no sense at all. I know that. But they did in 1800, probably because they just didn't quite understand and that meant something more exotic to them. But here he is, the philosopher, who wrote you know, the Declaration of Independence to talk about the rights of man, and yet he's a slave owner. So basically it's mocking him. And that's when I get that Slavery. In 1804, it would become a full-fledged issue about slavery. So I'm going to put it right here because it fits in with this talk about not just slave power, but what kind of society does slavery create, the system of slavery. This is an anti-Jefferson picture. It was a watercolor or wood cutting, and then they watercolored it. Virginian luxuries. He's the Virginian. You get the gist of this. 
I enjoy my luxurious life because of whipping slaves to make them do the work, and then remember the fornication laws, right? And the name Sally Hemings will soon come up. It's whispered in 1800. It's going to be well known by 1804. Sally Hemings was Jefferson's slave. And she would have five Jeff of Jefferson children. And because you know the complexities of Thomas Jefferson, what type of guy he was, who claimed he hated slavery, you think he freed his children? How about when he died? You think he freed him? No. Yeah. So these guys would get their slaves pregnant so that they could have more slaves. But it's their kids, so I would. Well. <laughs> like, why would you want your kid to be a slave? Yes! <laughs> because they didn't want to have kids. And they didn't want to give them the property. And they might not have had, they, they weren't, let's be clear, but they, they weren't raping their slaves to get, make more slaves. They were raping their slaves to rape them, and the kids were in. Now, you know, I'm not going to go to the biology. <laughs> There's a stork and all kinds of stuff. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. Great system. Huh? Yeah. But you know, I mean, that issue about that has been around forever, unfortunately. So. so this is a big issue, and it's coming one. But the thing we have to get about it is, it's not the attack on the South, because this was more like, God, yeah, those bunch of slavery just leads to these guys being just horrible people, degenerates. It's the Southern reaction to this attack. Southerners didn't see this as, ooh, we have a really bad system. They saw it as, they hate us up there. Northerners hate us. They're doing this because they hate us. They're jealous of our system. And they're trying to make us look like we're bad people. We're not bad people. And when people think that you're out to get them, you're paranoid, what do you do? How do you act? What's that? Very defensive. And within 30 years, people in the South will look at every action by the North or Northern politicians as a direct attack on them. Oh, sure, they might say this, but they really mean this and they're coming to get us. And this attitude of paranoia that they're all out to get us will help, most certainly help, lead to the Civil War. By the 1850s, Southerners were convinced they're all out to get us. We have to strike now. We have to strike now. And you see this a lot, especially when someone busts you for something you did wrong. You get mad at them. How dare you? You try to find something against them. Yeah, say, I, mean, I know, not us in here. We would never do that. We just have full responsibility and move on. Wouldn't you? Yes. So, this happened in the South? Yeah, this was the South. Because that's where the vast majority of slaves were. Okay. And, I mean, it happened in the North, but they just were just a tiny percentage of slave holders were in the North. Got it? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. So, <laughs> we're going to dub this, this is something called the Age of Jefferson. And along with the next about 25 years. And the whole point about this is, it's the beginning of kind of the modern way Americans are going to think about themselves. And to this day, there's going to be elements of Jefferson that Americans would like themselves to be. And the, and the inauguration, Republicans dubbed the Revolution of 1800. The idea being you know, a radical shift towards regular people having a voice in government. But in reality, the revolution was more almost anticlimactic. The revolution was a fact that, and this actually is revolutionary, but we might not think of it this way. Here you have one faction removed from power and replaced by another faction in control, control of the country. And there wasn't civil war. At least over this. There wasn't radical change. The previous faction were not arrested and put into camps or something. There was a peaceful exchange of power. And the Republicans really didn't change that much. The Republicans kept the basic principles of federalist government that they established over the previous 12 years. Yes, they had a different philosophy, they wanted a different direction, 
And this almost, I mean, how radical this is kind of lost in fact that it wasn't as radical as people thought it was going to be. Adams thought the country was done. He thought it was over. He would be the one of only two presidents to not go to the inauguration of his successor. He was so mad, he was pouting. That's my acting right now. I think it's pretty good. You want to want to guess the other president who did not go, removed from power, did not go to their successor's inauguration? Obviously, if a president dies in office, it doesn't count. <laughs> you want to know? John Quincy Adams, his son. He didn't go to Andrew Jackson's inauguration. I guess that pouting, in fact it does, that the friends in the family. So, Jefferson, and this is supposed to represent him. This is a little bit kind of awkward. I'm not sure what's going on here. And the whole thing was he acted like a common man. So supposedly he walked. Here it shows him actually riding his horse to the inauguration. And he would normally ride through town with, with uh, dirty clothes or torn breeches. Pants were called breeches. And... You try to act like a common man, and that fit in with what we have to get here, the philosophy of Jefferson, Jefferson's philosophy. And the reason this is important is because, really, Americans are going to start thinking this as their philosophy. In 20 years, the Federalist Party is going to be gone. It will be absorbed by the Republicans, and the Federalists are going to adopt parts of Jefferson's philosophy and alter it to their point of view. Now, that will blow up in four years, but to this day, People want elements of this. They like to see themselves as elements of Jefferson's philosophy. But it's a myth. The first part of his philosophy, the common man. The Republican Party saw themselves as the party of common men. Now, common does not mean average. What does common mean? This comes from Old English as a commoner. Meaning their parents were not necessarily what? Aristocrats, noble. What we're talking about, people of average birth can do great things. If given the chance, common people can do anything. You are not special, intelligent, worthy of some kind of control because your parents are wealthy or this new kind of aristocracy based upon wealth or land or whatever it might be. The Jeffersonian idea, everybody has equal access. Remember, life, liberty, and the one that talks about this, the pursuit of what? Happiness. Regardless of your birth. And Americans like that idea. Now we're talking about white men here, baby steps towards uh, equality for everybody, but we like this idea. Yeah, we can all do this. Everybody in America has an equal, equal opportunity to do whatever they can. Today, they'll say middle class. That was the development of like, the Great Depression after that. We're a middle class country. And if you watch the debates, uh, when they're not doing whatever they're doing, and wait till this next debate, it's going to be crazy town. But, yeah, debates are disgusting. If that would be so, they were going to be like this get together to discuss ideas. But, we like to be middle class. Middle class, sometimes you're middle class, we're a middle class country. Help the middle class, what about the middle class? Everyone, everybody wants to be that, they like that ideal of it. So it still goes on today. But you notice, eh, maybe not. We like that idea, but think about Jefferson. In the party of the common man, don't lurk outside my door, Doc. You okay? He's a wealthy plantation. He got his plantation in the slaves because he inherited it. He's talking about it and he's the exact opposite person. He's the elite. Heck, he wrote the Declaration of Independence. He's the elite of the elite. You can't get any more elite than Thomas Jefferson. He's talking about the common man. He wears dirty clothes like he's a working man. And he doesn't cultivate the soil. Somebody else does. And his house is a classic example of this contradiction. We're going to fight for the common man by being elite. That's his house. That's Monticello. 
Has anyone been there? If you get a chance, it's in Virginia, east of Richmond. It is really cool. And he designed it himself. I mean, he was a Renaissance man. He could do everything. He dabbled in science and writing and everything else. How many stories are in this house? Better question. How many stories are here? Between this and this. How many stories? What? What? No way! Well, what, what you get is this. From a distance, it looks like a one-story box. He wants the illusion like it's a house of more of a common man. But when you get closer, you'll notice something just incredible. This door is huge. It's like twice the size of me. You know, the steps are actually really small. They look really small to get closer. No, they're average size steps. Because the door is so big, this window, massive. It is so long, there are three, or I'm sorry, there's two floors. You can't really see them unless you're right next to the window. But the floor goes right into the window. So from a distance, it looks like a one-story house. It's an illusion, though. I'm just a common man like you. You get closer. In fact, it's really cool. When you go there, you walk along right here. So you go, can start here, you walk around, and it's this optical illusion. It's just something you see because you're you're almost half a mile away when you start walking unless you drive up that close. And you're walking along, and it looks like this little house. And then it's like all of a sudden, boom, it's huge. It's just all of a sudden, that's how the illusion works. The illusion of, I'm a common man. I'm just like everybody else. It's a really cool house. I got to admit, if you get a chance, it's cool. Nickel, if you look in the back of the nickel, it's Monticello on the back of the nickel. And they were obsessed with Roman architecture. This is based on the Roman pantheon, freestanding dome. The second U.S. Capitol building, which is the current U.S. Capitol building, originally that was the dome, was copied that. So they added the taller rotunda to copy uh, St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Two, Elvis. Elvis was a major part of his philosophy because he liked really bad movies like Viva Las Vegas. What happened? Where did it go? Oh, no. Huh. Oh, we ain't gone. It's gone! Okay. When I get it back up here, no, we're not, we're not going to finish, but I'll let you look at an ad for uh, Planet of the Apes stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Huh? Well, I don't have them all, but I do have the treehouse. Why do I have that? A better question is, why don't you? Okay, there we go. We're doing uh, the Vietnam War and special topics. We're just going to just literally finishing the war today. So I want to show them an ad from 1975 for Planet of the Apes toys. Why was that a thing? Because the Earth disappeared and was replaced by talking apes. So it's in all the books. It's on. It's page 1,000 of your textbook. The movie, about four or five Planet of the Apes movies were made. 69 is early 70s, and they were just a phenomenal. So, like, these are the first real movies that had toys. You know. All right, so, number two, agrarian. Much like the Republicans, we mentioned this before, you may want an agrarian society with yo, man! Yo, man are independent farmers. And the idea was... This is actually from the Grange movement from the 1870s, but this idea that an independent farmer is the master of his domain because nobody tells him what to do, not like a wage slave. You work for a wage, you're a slave. But once again, let's get to the contradiction. Jefferson talked about this, wanted land for a small yeoman farmers. What was he? He wasn't out there tilling the soil. Yeah, he's a slaveholder who you actually rented his slaves out and took the money for it. And just as bad as every other slaveholder. Yet he claimed 
his policies are for them. Same thing with middle class, middle class. Frugal. Frugal does not mean cheap per se. What it means is careful with government money. At least careful with money in this context, government money. He wanted to lower taxes and lower debt. A lot of that debt that comes from, remember, the Assumption Bill by Hamilton. And so when the big areas of the cut back, because government spending back then was still really small, we had a tiny military. Here's West Point, the fort. They cut back on the military, the Army, and the Navy significantly during Jefferson's administration. Now, we did not believe in a large standing army because that led to tyranny. But they almost got rid of the army completely. And the Navy went into mothballs. Well, this won't be an issue unless you, I don't know, maybe fight the largest naval power in the world in a full-scale war in 11 years. Probably not a big issue unless you do that. Yes, the U.S. will declare war on Britain in 1812. And we didn't have a military. It might be a good idea not to have a military. You can make arguments for that. But then you probably shouldn't go to war with other people. Yes, we barely made it. Why would we go to war with people we just broke away from who almost beat us multiple times? Canada. I'll tell you about it Friday. Next. Yes. What was the anti-wage society? What? I guess I misunderstood. The anti-wage society? Oh, he didn't want people being wage earners because then they're not independent. He called wage earners wage slaves. Sorry, I wasn't clear on that. I think I'm talking about food. What? Did I miss something? I don't know, sometimes I start going off on tangents and then promptly forget what I was talking about. Be like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they feared a large central government. <clears throat> government. <laughs> you with me? Government. <laughs> what they thought was, and I went in the wrong order here, but government only helps wealthy merchants, their point of view. Big government. So government should be hands off. Let the people decide on for themselves, and that will protect small. Protect small farmers, protect small shops. And the term for hands-off in government will come from a book by Adam Smith, which we'll get to later, but all we need to know is, now in French it would be more like laissez-faire, but we don't speak foreign languages in here. We be speaking American. <laughs> and in American, that is laissez-faire, correct? And that means hands off by government. Yes, this is an economics term, and every FBI yeah, I have a minor in economics. Why? Why not? But I remember economics professors, I like college. economics professors, all these things. They said, you know, I always said laws are fair. And I remember people who were like French majors, just said, uh, <laughs> anybody in French now? All of <laughs> You're probably taking another foreign language, though, aren't you? Who's here taking English? Herders, uh, speak American. Sure. Yeah. 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 I don't really get much. I know what it is. I know what it is. And you can get it. Right? Yeah. 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 I'm not going to get your full breath. That's right now. Hey. No, no, no. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. You got a chance to come with that. You would do this one. Tomorrow. I want you to bring in. I'm going to start the question. Yeah. Bring in if you want to show it, give me a nice transform out my thesis. Good thesis. Yeah. Think about having all the this in there. Okay. Okay. Want me to read, do an outline? Yeah, outline piece. Just for that right now. No, I'll talk about what you want to do with that. Yeah. 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 Katie, are you bugging my class? Yeah. Okay, good. Sorry. Damn, government. 